Okay. Um, I think it is 10 a.m. on the dot and we can get started. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are very thankful that you would uh, make time to join us for our seventh webinar. Uh, today we look at sustainable retirement, um, uh, the housing and benefits perspective, and we're very honored to have with us Mr. Nzomo Mutuku, uh, the CEO of uh, the Retirement Benefits Authority. We also look forward to be joined by uh, our board chairperson, uh, Mr. Nelson Kuria, and the principal secretary, Housing, Urban Development and Public Works, Mr. Charles Hinga. Um, mm -hmm. So as we wait for the two gentlemen, I think we'll get started. Um, just some house rules. Please use the Q&A function if you have any question during the presentation, and we will make sure to read out as many as possible and answer them as much as possible during the webinar. You may also uh, raise your hand, and after each presenter, we will allow some of us an opportunity to speak and ask their questions to the panelists. The session is going to be recorded. Uh, we will share with all the participants the slides and the recording uh, via email afterwards. Um, and feel free to circulate this to your contacts, to your members, to other board of trustees, uh, as and when you meet with them. Uh, my name is Bansi Kaleli, and I'll be moderating this um, session. And um, to get us started, um, I just want to give you a reminder, please make sure that you um, look out for us on our social media handles. Our Facebook is Facebook Kenya, Twitter, and North Kenya, uh, sorry, our Facebook is Enwell Kenya, Twitter Enwell Kenya, and LinkedIn Enwell Financial Services. We'll also have the conversation going on that front. Um, so before we start, I'd like for us to just have a very quick poll, and you will see a few questions on your screen right now. If you are a homeowner as it is, how does it feel staying in your own home? And if you're in a rental like some of us, how does that feel at the end of every month? I think by fifth, what feelings... Um, go through your, your heart and mind when it comes to paying rent. So please complete that and then I'll release the results in just a minute. Okay, I'll end the poll in another 10 seconds. Uh, okay, I think you should be able to see the results on your screen. Um, so for the homeowners, um, how does it feel for you to, well, staying at your home? 76% uh, of us are feeling very satisfied. Um, they have increased in freedom, security, and stability. Now, for the ones uh, who are in a rental, so how does it feel like to pay rent by the fifth of every month? 37% uh, of us, it makes me desire to be a homeowner. Interestingly, 30% of us feel pain, just pure pain. <laughs> and we hope that for this group of people in pain, we will be able to offer you solutions um, through this uh, webinar. We do have with us um, you know, people who are able to influence decisions within this industry. And we really hope that through these conversations, through dialogue, uh, we will be able to change the situation for not only ourselves, but also our members. 
So um, a week ago, about a week ago, we decided to conduct a quick survey on our um, on our membership. Uh, we got around 150 members who answered to this um, poll, and we asked number one, where do you currently reside? Interest, interestingly, 55% um, of the people who responded um, live in a rental home as it is, so they're the people experiencing pure pain, and 38% are in a purchase home. Then we sought to also ask, um, so if you were to get a house uh, for the 58%, uh, what, what would be your source of funds? Uh, majority of us chose to go with a loan, a bank loan uh, at 28% and a circle loan at 25%, giving it, when you combine the two, giving us an average of about 53% uh, of us uh, choose a loan. And then interestingly, only 18% of the respondents would choose to go with a pension back loan. Um, so that's why we thought it was important for us to have this conversation, so that you can just increase um, awareness on what the pension back loan means, the benefits, and uh, also the challenges that uh, our members need to be aware of, the process that it will take for them even to take up the loan. Then our final question was, what factors inhibit you from owning a home? And the highest factor was high interest rates, followed by soaring property prices. Uh, then the third uh, was lack of access or credit, and then expensive initial setup costs. So also through this conversation, we hope to be able to solve some of these challenges. And uh, before we get onto our first speaker, I noticed that our chair, Mr. Nelson Kuria, has joined us. Um, Nelson, it is a very great privilege to have you here with us. As you may know. Thank you, Bansi. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Kuria has been quite instrumental in the development of the insurance industry, and he has very many years of experience uh, in senior levels and right now offering a lot of advice and uh, governance uh, on board. So Mr. Kuria, I'd like you to say hello to our participants and the panelists before we get started. Yeah, thank you, Bansi, and a very good morning to my friend, um, CEO Bonanzomo. Good to see you. How are you doing? He is muted. Uh, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you also. Good to see you. It's yeah. good to see you after quite a while. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind response. We do appreciate. And I see you, Simon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Chair, and uh, great to see you, Chair. Thank you. It's good thank to have you. you. Today thank I'm you. working at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new norm. Yes. That's a new norm. Yes. That's thank right. Yeah. Okay. So the PS so, uh, is yet to join. Uh, he's, uh, we've just been informed, he's still held up in another meeting, but he's going to join. Uh, but someone is also from his office is already coming on and uh, we are already in touch with them. So I think the tail end of it, he will be joining and also making his presentation. Okay, yeah. Jay, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Chair, you were on mute for the last, um, you know, uh, comment you made. Kindly just repeat that. Oh, I was just saying that it is uh, uh, quite uh, gratifying this morning to see the CEO of uh, RBA and uh, even him accepting to come and uh, participate in our webinar. We are, we are quite grateful for his uh, kind gesture. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to more engagement, particularly in these extraordinary times. Yes. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, um, Chair. And uh, without further ado, I think I'll just introduce uh, our industry boss, Mr. Nzomo Mutuku, um, to give us his remarks uh, on, the, on the topic of housing and sustainability even in retirement. Uh, Mr. Mutuku is currently CEO of RBA, as I mentioned. He has a wealth of experience having worked uh, in the National Treasury and uh, CBK. Um, he has extensive training in question related matters um, from locally to the UK, US, um, Harvard University, Wharton, 
University. So welcome so much, sir. Um, please feel free to share your screen and start your presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bansi. Uh, thank you, Chairman and uh, CEO <coughs> team for inviting me once again. I'm always happy to participate in these forums and uh, share what we are doing uh, with the industry players and the stakeholders mm -hmm. and the members. I can see we are very large number of participants on board. So welcome everybody and uh, good morning. So <coughs> I'm going to talk about two areas. Uh, one is um, how we have been trying to support the industry and the members in light of COVID pandemic. And two, which is really the main focus of today, and the issue of um, housing uh, and how we can play our role also to help people get housing. I think Bansi in your survey, uh, the next question you'd have asked after asking how people feel about paying rent is how they feel about paying mortgages. Because mortgages can be very painful also. When you are yes. paying those high taxes, mm. it's very painful. And sometimes you pay for years and not only to find your balance has not moved because uh, you have been paying interest. But not <laughs> yeah, uh, next time <laughs> we'll add that. Thank you, sir. So, uh, let me see if I can get this to move. Yes, I'll start by just telling you about where the industry was other than December, um, the issues of uh, the COVID effects and response, and then um, the mortgage uh, issues. I think some of you are familiar with these figures. Um, as of December, our industry assets were 1.3 trillion uh, shillings, uh, having grown steadily over the years. In terms of membership, we had reached 3.2 million members in different schemes. Our industry was very dynamic. We have all kinds of new innovations in our industry. We have umbrella schemes which came recently and have done very well. Individual schemes which are doing very well. And we continue to see more service providers coming on board. In the first quarter, we were able to register a new fund manager, that was APSA. We were able to register a new administrator, uh, that was Cusco bringing our total administrators 31 and managers to 24 and uh, we have 11 custodians so these are very impressive uh, uh, figures if you compare with many uh, african countries uh, you don't get this kind of, um, of very well developed pension industry you may have seen an article in the papers last week where um, the alliance group did a survey of pensions in africa and uh, kenya was ranked number two in terms of our pension sector after south africa so for a country, if you look at our GDP and so on, we are not so highly ranked, but in terms of pension sector uh, development, we are ranked number two in Africa. Uh, if you look at the coverage, we have been able to take this up to um, 22% as of 2019. Uh, you may remember that we launched a strategic plan last year. We are targeting to get to 30% within the five-year period. So within the first six months, we had been able to move from 20% to 22%. We were doing very well in terms of achieving the 30% target over the five year period. And again, this increase in coverage was driven uh, by uh, inroads into the informal sector, uh, where we have low, very low coverage. And these inroads were made through uh, use of technology. So we saw schemes uh, like NREL, NSSF, and others reaching out to the informal sector by having products which are mobile phone based and which informal sector players can easily uh, join and contribute for their retirement. So things were looking pretty good as at uh, December. On the investment side, um, <coughs> we had a well diversified investment portfolio. Uh, we have investments, the highest is government securities, around 42% of total assets. Uh, which is still low if you look at most African countries where you find 70% uh, or so of assets are in government securities. So it is uh, still a well diversified portfolio. We had around 18% um, in equities and 18% in, in real estate, 15% in the insurance companies and smaller amounts in other, other investments. And we also saw for the first time all over time increasing investment in alternative assets such as uh, private equity. Uh, coming on board. Uh, so a well diversified investment uh, portfolio uh, for the schemes. So if you look at property, you will see, realize that we have quite high investment in real estate already. And this also includes residential houses. So already pension schemes have helped Kenyans to get homes. Uh, you know, we have estates like Embakasi Estate built by 
and SSF, um, a number of estates in Athi River and so on, built by other schemes, uh, which um, Kenyans have been able to get homes through those, um, those developments. So uh, COVID uh, came and impacted us in a number of ways. Uh, it impacted our members uh, either directly because we have members who have, uh, have been infect, affected by COVID, tested positive, uh, hospitalized, and even some have passed away, sadly. Uh, we had employers who have been infected in a number of ways. Um, those industries which initially were, in the, were affected were those in the hospitality and tourism space, such as travel agents, hotels, airlines, uh, but then over time it has become much more broad-based and we are seeing impacts you know in all sectors of, of the economy in many cases the uh, members um, were retrenched from their jobs and they came to their schemes and took their money out so we had a direct loss from of assets from our scheme in other cases they may not have been sacked or so retrenched but they have been sent home on unpaid leave or they're operating on 50 percent salary and so on and again, that means the contributions coming in are less uh, than would have been the case. And then we have those employers who have suspended contributions for a period. And again, it started in hospitality and tourism, uh, but now we see it in other sectors, education, because schools have, have closed and we're not getting fees. Hospitals, uh, people are not going to hospital for whatever reason. Um, a number of sectors we are seeing employers requesting for uh, holidays on contributions, again impacting on the liquidity and the assets of, of, of the scheme. And then for the existing assets, we saw losses. Uh, we saw a lot of volatility in the stock exchange, uh, huge drops. Um, we have seen rentals where not just commercial, but even residential tenants are not able to pay rent to the schemes who own the properties. And therefore, uh, that income has not come in. Offshore markets, um, they have really been impacted. You saw the US market uh, go down, then come up, and now it's going down again. So for those who have offshore investments, they're really uh, being impacted. Though there is some uh, protection coming from uh, the exchange rate um, depreciation that we have seen. And of course, uh, because of various restrictions in terms of meetings, in terms of movement and so on, uh, schemes are challenges with meeting the compliance uh, requirements. So to address this, uh, we took a few measures. If I can start with the last one on the compliance uh, side. Uh, sorry, before I do that, let me just give you some of the figures to show how this impact actually looks. Uh, so there, we have summarized the schemes that um, are requested for contribution suspension for period, some three months, some six months, and so on. And you can see we have 35 uh, occupational schemes. I don't know, earlier I didn't mention, but our total number of schemes is 1,258. So out of these, um, we have 35 occupational, five umbrella, three individual uh, schemes who have requested for um, suspension of contributions. Uh, the occupational schemes are, of course, reflecting 35 employers, but in the umbrella schemes, you have 11 employers who have applied, and uh, in the individual schemes, you have 37 employers who have um, applied. That gives you a total of 83. And this figure is increasing every day, because as I'm sitting here on my desk, I can see around five letters which have come uh, from other employers who are also requesting uh, contribution uh, suspension. So the figure is increasing. We have tried to estimate for those particular schemes, how much contribution will not come in in this period. Uh, for the occupational schemes, we can get the figures easily. For the others, it's not so easy because they are coming through, um, you know, one scheme and many employers. Uh, but just from the occupational schemes alone, you can see it's almost two billion uh, of contributions which are not going to come in, you know, in the coming months that would otherwise have, have come in. So it is quite a significant figure. And it's likely to be higher when we add those under the umbrella and the individual schemes as well. We can see the stock market index there, how it has moved since January. You know, in January, it was up at uh, 2,700. Now it's at 1,982. Uh, there was some bit of recovery um, in March, April there, but uh, we are now seeing it uh, 
it's been kind of steady at around 1982. So that has been a direct hit on the assets of the pension schemes, albeit uh, unrealized, uh, <coughs> uh, under unrealized loss. So the measures we took, um, we did allow, and this has already passed now, um, we did allow schemes uh, to have an additional uh, period for submission of um, accounts, um, which uh, they were able to at least not be penalized for late submission. So that ended at the end of last month, and I'm happy to say that um, I think most schemes were able to now submit. Many actually submitted within the original time frame, uh, but those that did not were able to submit before the end of last month. And similarly for levy, uh, we did allow uh, schemes to pay based on earlier accounts. Uh, they didn't have to wait for the accounts. Uh, but again, most uh, schemes paid levy um, on time. Uh, it was not so much of a challenge. So that was one of the things we did. And then um, for the employers I've talked about in terms of remitting contributions, we have given them guidance as to how you can take this kind of holiday. Um, uh, depending on your circumstance, which is different from case to case uh, basis. And so for all those 83 um, that I've talked about up there, uh, their employers, uh, the cases are, uh, they differ in various ways. So in some cases, the employees are still working, but on reduced salary, like I said, so they still contribute, but they contribute on the lower uh, salary. In some cases, people are on paid leave, and in this case, um, they're treated as temporary absent from work, and therefore, there are no contributions. Uh, but when they resume, the contributions will, will, will come back. Where one wants to temporarily suspend contributions, then um, it has to be for a specified period. It's not indefinite. So, right? Most of them are three or six months. And um, again, this has to be done with consensus of the members. And this is very important. You know, as an employer, uh, you don't just wake up and write to RBA and say that um, I have decided to stop contributions. You have to get the consensus um, of the members uh, who will sign off on various documents and so on to say that hey, they understand the situation and they are agreeable to the, to the suspension. Otherwise, if you don't have the consensus of members and you do suspend uh, the contributions uh, unilaterally, then it becomes what we call unremitted contributions. Uh, it is money which is still owed to the scheme and uh, which you will have to pay later and uh, with interest as well. Um, so it's better to take the route of getting the consensus of, um, of the members. Again, uh, an employer can opt to vary the rates. So maybe you're contributing 15%, you say I can only afford 10%. Um, you can also do that. But again, there's normally a notice period that must be served before the, the new lower rate comes into effect. So it cannot be overnight as well. <clears throat> And the most drastic case, um, which we have seen very few, um, is where the employer gives up completely and decides to wind up um, uh, the scheme. This could happen, for example, if the employer decided to close business permanently. And we have a few cases, but very few. And therefore, they are going to uh, stop um, uh, the scheme. Or if they are still operating, and, but they decide that they don't want a scheme going forward, then they can also do so. But again, subject to notice period, um, which is defined in the trust deed. Will be a debt which is owed uh, to the scheme and which will have to be um, as the scheme is being wound up. So that was how we have advised um, employers in terms of suspension of contribution. And like I said, uh, we have received a number of those applications. Uh, for the schemes themselves, uh, we have postponed the, the trustee development training, which is a mandatory requirement. Um, Normally, when you're appointed as a trustee, you're required to do this training within uh, six months. It's normally a one-week training. It's an examinable training, so you have to pass the exam. And, you know, if you're unable to pass the exam, then you can no longer serve as, um, as a trustee. Uh, but since the training has been suspended, uh, <coughs> we have allowed uh, trustees to serve without doing the training. Uh, but we are at a very advanced stage of moving towards an online uh, platform so that the training can resume. Uh, so, so trustees can start getting ready, we shall soon uh, come back, uh, but this time it will be uh, online, uh, we don't have the physical meeting. Uh, we have some guidelines that we gazetted last year on good governance, which 
for the big schemes who are due to come into effect, so they should have complied by end of this month. And for the small schemes, um, one year from now, uh, but we have allowed them to defer compliance uh, so long as they're able to point out the challenges they're having and write to us. We had also allowed schemes to postpone AGMs and uh, reschedule uh, their own meetings. Uh, but I'm sure as Chairman Kuria will tell us, um, we have seen even listed companies now are having uh, the AGMs through online means. So we believe there's no reason why uh, pension schemes can also not uh, do the same. So we are really now, when we get requests, we are at asking the trustees to explore how they can have this through video conference. Another method. Uh, we have some trustees whose term is due to lapse, uh, and some which have lapsed. And, uh, again, because there's no AGM and so on, you can't have the elections or the nominations. No, in Africa, extension of terms is a very sensitive business. They're <laughs> trying to extend their terms uh, after serving two terms. <laughs> It's a sensitive issue, but um, in this case, we have allowed uh, trustees to extend their terms, but not for more than around six months, uh, so that uh, you know, within that time, the trustees organize themselves and have uh, the elections. So those are some of the measures that um, uh, we have taken. So we are also happy that um, the Tax Amendment Act, uh, which was passed, um, gave us some further uh, incentives and benefits uh, for the pensions industry. The marginal tax rate was reduced from 30% to 25%. So anybody who is uh, withdrawing, uh, you know, and getting his benefits and so on is now getting a maximum rate of 25%. And um, for those uh, getting the lump sums, um, the, the top, top rate was also reduced from the 600. You get the 600,000 first tax free. And then the amounts above that, uh, you also enjoy a lower rate. The tax bonds are also widened. So apart from reducing the top rate from 30 to 25%, even for the amounts below, uh, the rate is, um, uh, is, is lower. Uh, we had the tax free pension, which had been proposed to be removed for those above 65. Uh, luckily, the uh, MPs um, removed that. Uh, but now it has come back again uh, through the finance bill uh, which is currently being debated by the House. Uh, we have been hoping uh, that the MPs move it again. And I know the industry has filed a lot of memorandum to the National Assembly in this regard. So we really want to urge the members to do the same thing they did last time and remove this provision, which is uh, threatening to tax those above 65 who have currently been enjoying um, tax-free um, pension. And of course, in this time of COVID, uh, this, is, this is one of the most vulnerable groups who government is supporting. So I think on one hand, government is uh, even doing cash transfers and so on to this group. And on the other hand, government is saying that they want to tax um, uh, the same group. Uh, so I think uh, it's inconsistent. <clears throat> so coming now to the issue of housing, uh, which I know is our key issue of uh, discussion today. Uh, and I can see I only have two minutes left. Um, the Tax Amendment Act, the same act, did amend Section 38 of Retirement Benefits Act uh, to allow members of scheme to use a portion uh, of their benefits to purchase a house. Now, before, uh, that Section 38 allowed members to use a, a portion of their benefits as a guarantee to get a mortgage uh, to get a house. So here, we are adding an additional a provision that apart from using the money just as a guarantee to get a mortgage, you can actually use uh, the money to directly purchase a house. So this was a big, a big change. So the act was amended uh, and as RBA we issued some draft um, uh, regulations which we exposed to public. I'm happy to say we got very overwhelming uh, response from the public, uh, from members, from schemes, from service providers, even other government agencies and so on. Uh, we got a huge number of um, uh, comments, suggestions, uh, recommendations, which were very good. And uh, we were able to uh, go through them. It's taken us a while because there are so many, uh, but we were able to go through them. 
and we're able to pick a lot of things uh, that we have been able to incorporate into the into the regulations. So we're at the last stage. Uh, by next week, we shall forward uh, these regulations to, um, uh, to the cabinet sector and national treasury. And uh, the cabinet secretary will consider them. And uh, if it's agreeable, we can move towards uh, gazettement of the same. And then once they are gazetted, uh, you'll also table them in the National Assembly. And the committee on um, delegated legislation will also look at them. They'll also look at our process to see whether we need the public participation, which of course we have done. And then if they're happy, then they will come into effect. So that is where we are at the moment. So the idea of the drafts was to try to balance between allowing members to get a house, which is a good thing, but not compromising the ultimate objective of the pension scheme, which is to provide an income uh, to the member in retirement, which is why the pension scheme was started in the first place. Uh, the saving in the pension scheme was for purposes of, of pension in, in retirement. Uh, it can give other nice things. Uh, we have tried to use them to assist in medical, to assist in housing, and so on. Uh, but we should not compromise um, the ultimate objective. And also, we have to make sure that uh, we we uh, don't allow abuse. Uh, you know, people may access the money yet they are not actually buying any house. It could just be a shortcut or a leakage from uh, from the system. And also, we don't want trustees to have so much burden of uh, becoming. Uh, agents for procurement of houses and so on. So we had to put some of those kind of requirements in the drafts. So what the drafts had um, is that, you know, houses uh, are to be bought. They can only be residential houses, not commercial, because that's what the law uh, says. And um, similarly, they are for purchase. This question always comes uh, for construction. I think if you read the Act, the Act is talking about purchase, not talking about construction. So the regulations could not really uh, contradict what is in the law itself. Um, the institutions that can be purchased from, um, one of the comments that we caught from the industry, which was very good, is that we had mixed the institutions for mortgage and the institutions for purchase. So now we have separated, uh, so that is clear, which you can purchase from and which you get a mortgage um, uh, from. Uh, the draft had a limit, which was 40% of member uh, accumulated benefits and a maximum of 7 million. Here we got two views. Uh, a lot of people said that uh, 7 million is too high. Uh, we are compromising the retirement objective and the stability of the, the industry. We should go for something like 3 million and so on, which I believe is what P.S. Hinga is going to talk about in his presentation is what they have for affordable housing and also what they have under Kenya Mortgage Finance Corporation. And on the other hand, we've got others who said 7 million is not enough. If my 40%, you know, can get me 10 million, why deny me the chance to uh, take 10 million and buy a house of 10 million? So those are the two sides and we are trying to balance to see uh, where we can get an agreed, agreed position. The fields can only be used once and I think that is uh, obvious because um, if, you are, if the idea is for somebody to get a home, then you know you don't need to buy two homes. Uh, you can leave the rest for, for, for pension purposes. The facility is available before retirement, not afterwards. Of course, once you've retired and you've gotten your money, you're free to use your money whenever you want, including buying a home. Uh, so this is to help those who are still working. And uh, this, the, 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 the drafts also talked of some minimum requirements, procedures for application, and how quickly trustees have to respond when somebody um, applies so that applications don't hang for, for, for long periods. So that is what we had. But like I've said, uh, we are working on incorporating what we got from the industry. Uh, we really appreciated the many uh, comments that we received. Uh, we shall prepare this. When we go to the National Assembly, we shall not only table you know, the amended uh, uh, regulations, but we shall table our metrics having all the one hundreds and hundreds of comments that we received and how we addressed each comment. So it's quite, a, it's quite a task because we have to say, you know, Mr. Kamau submitted, he said that we should do this. This is how we have addressed his, uh, his comment. Then we go to Mr. Mutua, submitted this. This is what he said, this is how we have addressed his comment. So you can imagine it's quite an exercise, but we are
Okay. So allow me to stop there uh, just to show you uh, the various channels that we have uh, for getting services from us. So you don't need to come here to our offices. In fact, here we are maintaining uh, minimum uh, uh, staff, uh, but it's still open. Uh, but most of our staff are working from home, but we have put in place very many channels uh, that you can use in case you need to contact us. So thank you very much. And I look forward to, to the questions and the discussion. Thank you so much, Mr. Mutuku. That was a very good presentation. Um, I will allow a few participants to ask you questions directly. So if you have a question for Mr. Mutuku, please just use the raise hand function and I'll unmute you. In the meantime, I already see one question um, uh, on the Q&A platform and it's from an anonymous attendee who asks, with the current taxes imposed on pensioners, how will there be growth opportunities and uh, also opportunities for getting a home? And I had another question sent in earlier. Um, a member asks, um, what will happen uh, to the sustainability of schemes, say if a large number of members are allowed to take out the 40% or 7 million? Um, how do you ensure sustainability? And then how do you also ensure that the service providers um, are able to operate and survive in this environment, given that most service providers uh, charge a percentage of, uh, charge a fee as a percentage of the of the assets under management, and we expect the assets under management to go down. Then uh, I see Lucy Kaburia, who also asks, what happens to pensioners uh, who are in the middle of constructing a house? And Paul Okwemba asks, have you extended this product to members already paying mortgage? Um, I'll request you to answer those few questions, uh, then we can pick up a second round. If you have a question, please just raise your hand and then I will unmute you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bansi. Um, I think uh, the time you are breaking up, but I'm taking the three questions, sustainability, uh, the pensioners and those who are already on mortgage. Mm -hmm. In terms of sustainability, yes, um, we would not want a situation where, um, you know, 40% of 1.3 trillion is taken out of uh, the pension industry tomorrow. Uh, you know, that would, uh, that, that would have major implications. Uh, in fact, it would have macroeconomic implications even on other sectors, not just on the pension sector. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you look at the regulations, um, you know, it's not everybody who can uh, get their 40% out uh, because, you know, the average savings of many uh, Kenyans is not that much. So even if you allow them to take 40%, it's not enough. Yes, um, his connection seems to have broken. Um, I do hope we get him on. Let me just. I'll be exiting in preparation for the other meeting. Okay. Okay, that's fine, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you Appreciate. for your time. Okay. Uh, but since mm -hmm. the RBA CEO has. I uh, was just tackling questions. Yes. I don't know whether he's Mr. Mutuku. Actually, it seems like he's gone off completely. Uh, I think we can proceed on to the next presentation uh, by Lydia yes, Omalwa. Yes, he's back. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I invite my colleague Lydia. Um, as if you've been uh, religiously attending these sessions, I think you know Lydia from giving away gifts. Um, so welcome, Lydia. Thank you so much, Bansi. I'm waiting for my video to get on, but it didn't want people to see me, but I'm here now. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Welcome. And uh, I'm really grateful for this webinar because it's been um, a great opportunity for all of us to learn. And basically today, that, today I'm going to ask questions that are going to help us learn um, Father, so the first question today that I am going to ask, the, 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 the rewards are very catchy. I will mention after we answer the first question. And the first question I'm going to ask is, what is IRR? What is income replacement ratio? And um, how is it useful for retirement planning? Anyone who would like to answer that question just we're going to just pick one correct answer today so anyone who will answer the raising hand 
part, the first, that is what we're going to pick. Okay, so Lydia's question is what's IRR? If you have the correct answer, just raise your hand, we'll unmute you. And what's the gift today, Lydia? Well, we are going to get you a book upon visiting us and having a consultation. You're going to have a free consultation with our CEO. You can imagine how good that is and how beautiful that would feel. Okay. Hello, Bansi, I'm back. Welcome, okay. welcome back, sir. Welcome back. Sorry about that. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, Lydia, uh, as people are trying to figure out your answer, okay, see Phyllis. Let me allow Phyllis okay. to answer you, then we'll go back to Mr. Mutuku. Phyllis Njongoro, I've unmuted your speaker, please. Um, Thank you very much. I believe you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes. yes can. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, and I believe the IRR, or better known as the income replacement ratio, is the ratio of income immediately after retirement to income immediately before retirement. Mm -hmm. And yes. why is it important? Why is it important? It's important because it helps you understand how much of your pre um, retirement income you will be in a position to um, achieve and gain post retirement can you sustain the same um, lifestyle you had uh, post retirement um, as compared to what you had pre retirement okay uh, excellent thank answer. you so much yes clearly you yes, are I, um, class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally um that is a satisfactory answer you just earned yourself a free consultation session with our CEO, and you are going to get a book when you visit us. Very interesting and, title. And, uh, <laughs> Jerry, for your brilliant answer, we will get you a book, Good to Great, so that you move from just being good before retirement, and then you have a great retirement. <laughs> and uh, of course, we also just have a consultation, to understand um, how you plan your retirement. If you haven't gotten into retirement, we've been doing retirement planning sessions for uh, over almost like almost 20 years actually. And uh, we'll just share with you and see how we can develop a personal retirement planning uh, uh, strategy for yourself. And just to see that you enjoy your retirement uh, for your exemplary answer that you've shared with us this morning. So thank you so much. Back to you, Nancy. I yes. know time yes. is moving. Time is bad. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Simon and Lydia. Phyllis, please send us your number on the chat box that you can get in touch with you. So, Mr. Mutuku, I'll okay. go back to you. Um, if you may proceed with your answer. And then uh, if anyone else has a question, I'll allow a few more minutes to ask Mr. Mutuku your question. So raise your hand. Over to you. Thank you, Bansi, and apologies. I don't know what happened. I just seem to have been thrown off from the call. Okay. Uh, but I've put in place now. Redundancy. Okay. This time I should be. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I was answering three questions. The first one was on sustainability and uh, whether the industry can take, you know, people forty percent of assets coming out. And I was saying that um, no, we can't um, have um, forty percent of um, one point three trillion uh, exiting to buy houses. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not going to happen because if you look at the balances of most members. Uh, the balances are not high enough to allow them to buy a house. And therefore, this is actually an opportunity for members to increase their savings, uh, either through AVCs or other channels, um, so that um, they can now reach those thresholds to buy a house. You see, if you have uh, 5 million, 40% uh, of 5 million is, uh, is, two, is 2 million. You might not get a house for, uh, for 2 million. But if you increase through AVCs and you increase your you know, your balance for 10 million, then you can take 40% and get a house for 4 million. Um, so um, there's that control. And the other control, of course, is that on the supply side, uh, we don't have so many houses available. Uh, it will take some time. I know the ministry is doing a lot of great stuff that we're going to hear in the next presentation. Uh, but it will take some time for the supply side to, to, to get the houses for that people can, uh, can buy them. So in terms of sustainability, we don't expect so much um, shock.
immediately. We also expect this to drive more savings. And therefore, as money is coming out, we'll also have more savings coming in as people save uh, more. Um, there's a question of pensioners. I was not very clear, but I think the question was, um, uh, what would happen to a pensioner? Of course, this new product is really targeting those who are still working and not those who have retired. So, you know, those who have retired, they have already accessed their money. Uh, you can get your lump sum and use it to buy a house and so on. And so this will not really have an impact on, on the pensioners. Mm -hmm. The last question is a question we have uh, received a lot, um, even in the consultations was on mortgage. If you have a mortgage and you know, you're know you just struggling to pay the interest and all that, can you now get the pension money out and transfer it to uh, clear your mortgage so that you're left without debt? Um, it's something we have looked at, but as per the drafts, uh, the way the drafts are is no. Um, the idea was to target those who have been excluded by the current financial system who are not able to get mortgages. And therefore, uh, there are first-time owners who are not able to work within the current system. Those within the current system, they can benefit from the other product of the guarantee uh, and so on. And we didn't feel that they need, um, they need to be assisted. So uh, as for the drafts, no, you can't do that. Uh, but it's one of the things you have gotten and we are looking at well it. So those are the three questions that I picked. Uh, okay. I'll allow two more people to ask you questions. I see Eric Owiti and Felix Maloba. Uh, I've allowed you to talk, just unmute your speak yourselves and ask your questions. Thank you, you can get me? Yes. My, my question to, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mzombo for the elaborate presentation. Now my question is, we have, uh, uh, defined benefit schemes and we have defined uh, contribution schemes. So the 40% of accumulated benefits, how are we looking at it? Is it in the defined benefits or in the defined uh, contribution? Because the payout, I believe, are a bit different. In the defined benefit, it's more of a it's more of a pension and some pension and in a defined contribution, it's more of a provident fund where you get your one-off. So uh, with this 40%, how, how are you looking at it? It's uh, how are you going about it? Which kind of payout is it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Felix, over to you. Thank you, Bansi. Uh, thank you, Bonanzomo, for that uh, good presentation, though I got in midway. My question is uh, one very simple. I want to find out whether there is uh, an express definition of what you mean by a house, or does it fall under the confines of uh, it could, could uh, North Plan development qualify for a house, or a site and service scheme qualify for a house? Thank you. Thank you, Felix. And finally, Stephen Ondari. Yeah, thank you, CRBA. I'd like to just maybe get your thoughts on what lessons has the industry learned from the slow uptake of the mortgage uh, regulations that were gazetted in 2012 that necessitated the slow uptake of that uh, gazettement that with this new amendment we expect maybe more trustees to implement this in their schemes and uh, bearing in mind their additional responsibilities to the trustees might be actually a factor that makes a lot of trustees very hesitant to implement maybe some of these um, regulations. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Mr. Mutuko. Thank you very much uh, for those um, for those questions. Um, the first one on DB versus DC um, it applies to both. Uh, we have we have DB schemes uh, which are provident funds, and we also have DC schemes, which are pension schemes. Actually, the majority of schemes in Kenya are DC pension uh, pension schemes. So it applies to both. Uh, you know, the issue of pension and provident applies at retirement, uh, but in between, in both schemes, you have a benefit that is accrued to you. In the DB, it is calculated using a formula, which is based on salaries of service and so on. The DC is like a bank account amount, which is there for the interest, which is earned. So in both cases, you can establish what an individual has in the scheme and take 40% of that. And that's what will be eligible for, for, uh, for this. However, it's good to point out that uh, if you're in a DB and there's a deficit, uh, then, you know, the 
will be after reducing for the fact that there's a deficit. <laughs> and similarly, if you're in a DC and uh, there are some unremitted contributions, the 40% will be uh, after factoring the unremitted. So it reduces the amount that you can take. So again, employers, it's important to make sure that they are up to date in their contributions and so on, so that members can get the full uh, benefit. Uh, Felix, what is meant by a house? Um, it's, it is a completed house. Uh, it's a residential house and it's completed. Uh, so you cannot uh, buy um, a plot and build, you cannot buy off plan and so on. And this is also related to Stephen's question. You know, we can't give so much administrative burden to trustees to go there and, you know, being able to supervise whether a house is being built or off plan and all that. It will become so complicated for the trustees. And as Stephen says, you know, this is not their, it's not their core business. These trustees are mainly employees who have other jobs. We cannot make it so difficult for them. So the regulations talk of a complete um, house. And finally, Stephen, the issue of slope take, you're absolutely right. We had these regulations, which I mentioned earlier. It allowed you to use your pension to guarantee a mortgage. We thought this would make it easier for people to get mortgages because apart from having the house as your security, you also have your pension. Right? It's like having double security, which on paper seemed like a great thing. But uptake was very slow. A part of the reason is because we have other constraints in the, in the financial system, the legal system and so on and when it comes to mortgages that is why we have very low uptake of mortgages you know issues of uh, charging process uh, and that is the, the if we want to sell selling process uh, and so on uh, we have uh, the interest rate issue where interest rates were very high so these constraints were still there and they became a constraint even on this issue of, um, of guarantee that is why now we have taken this other route of allowing direct access uh, so that one can actually get the money and buy the house. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Butuku. Because of time, I'll request that we hold the Q&A there. But we do have more questions on the Q&A platform. I'll request Mr. Mutuku if you're able just to give us uh, your feedback even as we proceed. Um, from the feedback, it's been a great presentation. We've learned a lot. I think every time I listen to you, I learn something new and interesting. So thank you so much for the time you spent with us. Um, so I will move over to the next presenter. As we await Mr. Hinga to join us, we do have a representative, Mr. Jerry Simu. Uh, Mr. Jerry is a graduate of the United States International University um, and is also a corporate finance expert, having studied both locally and abroad uh, on the same. So Jerry, uh, the floor is open. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Bansi. Um, and you will allow me not to join by video, um, okay. but I happen to be called uh, when I was driving mm -hmm. to, in the absence of Mr. Inga. Mm -hmm. So I just happened to stop on the, on the petrol station on the side to just um, take the presentation. So you'll allow me to just uh, maybe speak to it uh, okay. rather than, than present. Um, so thank you all. And, um, Mr. Nzomo, thank you. I happened to catch uh, most of your presentation. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was very detailed and elaborate. And um, we, I think, have been working at a common purpose of trying to um, create access for um, Kenyans. Sorry, sorry, Jerry. Um, yes. We we seem to have not a very stable connectivity there. So. I don't know whether you can get a, a little bit of a more stable positioning uh, for the benefit of the audience who are listening to you. Okay. Um, is that better now? Yes, it's slightly improved. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let me... Okay. Is can you hear me a bit better now? It's slightly better now. Is it good enough to proceed? Bansi, what do you think? Um, yes, I think we can proceed. 
I'll just yes, you can. Jerry. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so yes, I was saying um, and, and, uh, and thank you to uh, Mr. Mutuku for that background, particularly on the access to the accrued pension benefits for um, Kenyans to um, access um, home ownership. It's something that uh, we we have worked on as, at a common purpose, and um, we are glad that we have now reached there. So, if I may, then just give a little bit of uh, background um, in terms of the uh, affordable housing program, um, and t in terms of where we started, because the, the the key issue that we've had in affordable housing has been the risk that um, is perceived by developers in terms of market risk and the ability to 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 basically um, address that issue because um, most the, the issue we have today is um, the perception and the risk that banks would have would face when they look at um, providing a mortgage or a financing facility to people who earn, let's say 100,000, 150,000 shillings and below. And that, as a, as a result of that, that is where we've always, has been a systemic issue of market risk. Therefore, when we started, we, we, had, we had envisaged a program that was to be funded. And that funding was supposed to come from the one and a half percent um, statutory contribution that was going to come from both the employer and the employee that would have created a funding mechanism for um, to, for, to, to effectively provide funding. Um, once these houses are built by developers, we, there was a way to actually pay for, uh, pay for them. Uh, somewhere along the way, um, we have uh, had to pull back from this uh, statutory uh, contribution. And now where we are is effectively, um, we have had to look at um, what, how do we address the supply side and demand side um, issues. And a number of interventions have been made um, both by, as, as government, uh, um, to, to address these uh, supply side and demand side um, risks. So when we look at the supply side, um, there have been interventions to provide um, relief um, to developers um, and to address the cost of home built of building a home and the number of the, these interventions include um, the VAT exemption um, on uh, on construction so that addresses um, the cost of home ownership and uh, reduces the the ability to uh, reduces the cost uh, of about at about nine percent. Now, um, this is an important intervention because what it does is it it, it allows today if uh, if the cost of a home is brought down by approximately nine percent, it is it is a, it is a critical intervention uh, because that addresses part of the supply side issue. Other interventions that we have made include. Um, in, uh, the corporate tax. Corporate tax on affordable housing has been dropped by 50% um, for So again, that allows um, the industry that is looking at providing homes in this um, segment of affordable housing, um, look, they are able to look at it and see the attractiveness to participate in this sector. So that is another, another important intervention that has been made. In addition to that, um, there is the import levies in affordable housing have been dropped um, by, they were capped at one and a half percent for um, railway development levy. And therefore for the, for the imported uh, content, which is, um, limited there is the capping of the import of the import de de development levy at one and a half percent um, on the demand side a number of interventions have also been made to 
to the homeowner um, because as we address the supply side issue, it's, it was equally believed that we then, for the homeowner, um, the, the interventions include the um, stamp duty, uh, which has been waived, which was pre previously 4% on, uh, for homeowner. And therefore, it, that barrier to entry to a homeowner Um, has been dropped um, significantly so affordable housing in addition to that um, there is the um, affordable housing tax relief that was introduced and therefore what that does is for any um, person who is contributing um, into the into affordable housing into the national housing development fund is able to access a 15% tax relief on their contribution. And therefore, again, providing an incentive to the homeowner to come in and participate in that segment. So, um, so we've then this most recent um, intervention by RBA, again, is an important um, and additional pool of liquidity that is available from uh, that is available to homeowners to look at that segment and therefore we think if we look at all of these um, combined the sub-segment of affordable housing becomes more attractive and so we believe that um, the the um, this, this particular segment is one that it has been underserved um, previously, um, and, but as a result of these interventions, we're able to then start plugging those gaps and create a more attractive segment. So, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jerry, for the brief overview of uh, what the affordable housing uh, scheme means and what benefits are applicable. I request that if there's any participant with a question to Jerry, please just raise your hand and I'll, I'll mute you. Uh, but from your presentation, I did pick out that um, there was um, a tax relief, um, the 15% relief on contributions. Is there a way we can merge this with pension just so that um, even pensioners saving for purposes of retirement and also for housing do enjoy this? And then I have a question here from Jafet Musao who asks, what the, what's the definition of an affordable house uh, that qualifies for the demand side uh, initiatives. Um, I see a hand from uh, Felix Maloba. I'll allow him, then you can answer the three questions. Uh, Felix, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Bansi. Thank you, James, for that brief and concise presentation. My question touches on the supply side of things. Uh, especially given the fact that uh, you're looking at uh, financing for the will-be buyers. And if you are to look at the current interest regime, you're looking at double-digit interest rates, which are untenable, uh, even for those prices for affordable housing, given the average uh, disposable income. So I just wanted to find if there is any connection uh, between the product, between your initiatives and the KMRC and how far that has progressed. Because um, I'm seeing from where I see it, it's time to be guided. At the, at the current uh, interest dispensation, you're still going to struggle on the demand side of things. That's it. Um, thank you, Felix. And um, I will allow Jerry to respond to the three questions. Okay. Um, in terms of the affordable housing classification, the, it was driven by obviously the issue of affordability and therefore typically um, you need to look at it from what is if someone was spending roughly say 30% of their disposable income, 
um, what would they be able to afford in terms of um, a monthly repayment? So the, the thinking, therefore, that's why we ended up coming with the, with the caps within affordable housing. And therefore, the houses are at roughly uh, 50,000, a range of between 50 and 55,000 shillings a square meter. Therefore, if you look at the, um, you typically have found houses within what we've been able to roll out has been houses between 1.5 uh, for one bedroom, uh, 2 million for uh, two bedroom, and 3 million shillings for uh, three bedroom. Therefore, um, if you then work it backwards, would be able to, you'd be able to be able to provide supply um, of units at, if you were to work at, let's say for instance, and maybe then this connects back to the second question um, or to the last question around the affordability, because today um, Kenya Mortgage uh, Refinance KMRC, when they provide um, their refinancing facility to the banks, they are doing it at a rate that is concessional and therefore it is implied that the lending that the banks would then transmit back to the um, homeowner is at a uh, single digit. Then work that in combination with the price of a house that is um, an affordable rate that we had envisaged of about that rate of about 3 million, therefore then provides um, a rate a monthly repayment that is um, more affordable to people who are aspiring to buy homes. So I think it'll be a combination of, of both um, and, and so as opposed to looking at it in isolation. Um, thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, due to time constraints, we'll allow you um, to end it there. But if you have other questions on the Q&A, um, if you're able to, please just respond to them. And thanks a lot for having to stop and take up this session. We do appreciate. Um, and please do pass our regards to the PS. We'd have loved to have him here, but we do understand that duty calls. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our boss, uh, Mr. Simon Ofubwa. Uh, he's going to be our last speaker. Um, Simon is the Managing Director, Enos Financial Services. Um, he's had a great industrious career um, in the retirement benefits industry. And he's also seen Enos grow uh, in just nine years. Uh, we're in three countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Mauritius, and serving over 50,000 uh, members with a portfolio of 620 million USD uh, in excess of 620 million. Um, so welcome, Simon. Um, and I do hope you can see the the poll results on the screen and i hope you'll speak about this especially for us who are tired of paying rent and are in pain welcome simon thank you so much uh, bansi thank you ceo retirement benefits authority uh, thank you jerry uh, for the insightful presentation that you have uh, shared with us this morning uh, straight into the poll very interesting that um, how does it feel like to stay in your own house. And the emotional connectivity that comes out there is very satisfied. Uh, it feels like you are very secure, stable, and it feels like you're very free. Uh, so it, 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 it sort of tends to imply that when you are renting, you are like in a prison, uh, and uh, sort of you don't have that. You even walk to your own rented house carefully, <laughs> especially if you haven't paid rent. <laughs> so then the landlord wouldn't notice that you, <laughs> you are in the house. Uh, but if you are in your own house, um, you start singing from the gate. Uh, such is the freedom and joy that uh, when you get to have your own house. I'll just go straight into uh, my presentation this morning. And um, for all the panelists that are on, really a great honor and a privilege to have you. Home ownership and retirement planning is a very big uh, entwined and combination. Um, and just from um, a recent polling by FinAccess and say that a third of the public sector workers and a quarter or urban wage workers live in inadequate housing conditions. 
uh, also semi-permanent or temporary conditions as well. And there's also issues of overcrowding and poor sanitation. Such are the concerns that affect dignity in retirement. And when we are looking at retirement, uh, we are hoping that one can stay in a very modest, good house while they're enjoying their pension as the CEO of the Retirement Benefits Authority has observed. So uh, in the two critical phases of our life is that initially you go to school to accumulate what you call knowledge capital. And that knowledge capital, you bring it in quotes into the stock exchange of um, knowledge. We call it a, the labor market. I use the word in quotes because uh, it's not as direct as it is. And in exchange of your skill, the employer gives you some income through which part you meet your immediate needs and part of it you start to accumulate uh, various uh, dimensions of assets that cushion your financial well-being uh, at the decumulation phase. Obviously, if you haven't accumulated anything, I usually say if you eat your future now, you won't have anything to eat when you get into retirement. Your future might as well just eat yourself. That might be a very painful experience. So we have chance that we have to balance at this, at this hour to have a home ownership as part of the key critical pillar for retirement. And we thank, um, uh, of course, the government and also the Retirement Benefits Authority for the new initiative that would see most members uh, retire, perhaps uh, with an early access of a bit of their savings for home ownership. In a recent survey we did within our just this is just at this uh, top polling, um, and and this is just the age demographic within our membership of fifty thousand. You would notice that the bulk of them are ideally are uh, below below age uh, age four, uh, below age fifty on average. You would just put it at around age between age forty to age forty five. And this gives a whole uh, huge opportunity of time. And of course, they, in terms of saving and accumulation of their savings, while they are also perhaps also repaying their mortgage, especially if they, have, they are well enabled to access mortgage early enough. We also did ask um, um, a question and say, which of these describes your salary grade? And the bulk of the income is, um, uh, way below 100, and this, of course, will also go hand in hand with the recent Kenya National Bureau of Statistics that just below, about below three to five percent uh, high income earners, in this case, being uh, above above 100,000. Um, in terms of savings, uh, of course, it's to the right simply because the older one is perhaps and the more they have saved for retirement and accumulated in their saving. Therefore, if we are to apply maybe 30% access towards home ownership, they already have some fair level of capital. And we did go ahead and ask them, so what kind of development would you prefer? And uh, the bulk of them would like to have a development for home ownership that is near an urban uh, center. Uh, only 7% would want to go back to their ancestral home. And then there's also the other um, uh, component that of, of, of response, the response that we got that 35% would like to have uh, rental development. And this is a very interesting um, observation that most people, when they get into retirement, they are looking at not Um, our apologies for that. It seems Mr. Fubo has an issue with his audio. Uh, he should be joining us soon. Uh, in the meantime, Lydia, if you're with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think you can ask the second poll um, question as we allow Simon to get okay. back on. Our apologies. Okay. Okay, thank you for having me back. I'm going to ask a second question. And uh, you're going to receive the very same reward. You're going to have a free consultation with our CEO and um, you're also going to get a book. The title of the book that you're going to get is going to be Who Moved My Cheese? It's a very interesting 
you will love it. So the question that I'm going to be asking um, follows through from what we had for question one. And the question is, suggest any two ways one can improve IRR towards retirement. We are going to pick only one correct answer and you're going to give us two suggestions. Okay. Who I see is a hand by Davis Kajogu. Yes. Davis, uh -huh. uh, please unmute your speaker and answer. My apologies. I had a challenge of connectivity there. It's okay, Simon. I don't know whether Bansi, Bansi um, can you see, see the screen? Uh, we are yet to see the screen, but Lydia was asking the question. Uh, th thank you for this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Davis? I'm saying the the usual one is the additional contribution uh, every month you can do a monthly additional contribution mm -hmm. and the yes. second one i was saying those people those people who normally receive the bonuses you receive uh, you can because it's coming through your payroll you mm -hmm. can also instruct your you can instruct your payroll manager to send that amount a portion of it direct to the, your pension mm -hmm. contribution Okay. Okay. Thank you, Davis. Okay. Yes, I, we do agree uh -huh. that bonus can go to the uh, your retirement savings. You, then you can have the bonus later. So thanks. Uh, please send us your number. Uh, as Lydia said, uh, you will get a free consultation with our MD yeah. and uh, the book Who Moved by Cheese. Um, so Simon, we'll go back to you. Thank you, Bansi. The internet tried to move my cheese, but I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my sincere apologies to the audience and uh, also the fellow panelists. I've tried to use another channel of internet. Hopefully it's going to be stable. So um, when we asked what factors currently would be uh, a barrier towards home ownership within our membership, the bulk of them was high interest, uh, the cost of credit, and then of course, um, expensive initial capital, which is basically the cost of land, and even just if you're talking about access to mortgage, you'd need to have uh, a deposit. I think this particular um, three variables in the low cost housing initiative by the government are actually solved because government is giving land and there's also bulk development, making it cheap and affordable. So this particular bit is sorted. And hopefully then through KMRC also this is sorted. And also the initial deposit through the uh, pension program that you can do up to 40% into home ownership. Hopefully then this is also sorted. And um, also lack of access to mortgage credit, again, this is sorted. So essentially uh, the bulk of members of pension schemes can um, hopefully, if they, we increase our saving in the pension we are not only going to achieve as well. Of course, in the affordable uh, housing program, you're looking at the supply side, you're look, which is provision of public land, uh, contribution, and then guaranteed offtake, and then tax incentives, as already Jerry, Jerry already mentioned. The demand side is subsidized long-term funding. Uh, which already have been talked about by uh, through the Kenya Mortgage Refinancing Facility. And then funding, of course, we've also talked about, but I think the pension sector now needs to, uh, which, which is rap rapidly taking its position, is to see then playing that critical um, opportunity of being an enabler. And I think there is a huge need in terms of creating a lot of awareness of the um, almost 2 million active servers uh, if you maybe estimate inclusive of the NSF uh, contribu contributors, that they need to be quite aware about this good initiative uh, to be able to benefit. And of course, to be aware of the regulations that are in draft um, and, and hopefully when they are gazetted. Um, and of course, uh, through the Kenya market refinancing, I know that would be need, a huge need for interlink with the pension sector. Um, in a peer review, I think what we are seeing in our nation is not 
uh, unusual in other markets like Singapore, I think this is of course, has pushed up the pool of savings because members are not able just to have a pension, but also home uh, ownership and also medical. So the proposal um, is 40% um, into home ownership. And um, just to be a little bit more practical, assuming you are at age 30, let's not talk theory. Um, I just hope that um, some of the audience uh, say if you are age 30 and your salary is 100,000, you possibly are paying rent at uh, 30,000 per month. If your savings accumulated, and this is based on our in-house average, is around uh, 1 million, and you take 40% of this 1 million into a 3 million uh, mortgage arrangement, um, you would then have a balance of 2.5 million for payment because around 400,000 is already deposited. If you are to repay that mortgage at 12% up to the year, up to age 60, your repayment will be around 27,000 per month. Hopefully, through the KMRC, if we reduce this uh, repayment to 7%, um, then you have um, your mortgage repayment at 18,000 per month. And remember, you are paying rent at 30,000 per month. So essentially, you end up having a little bit more money uh, on your payslip. And um, this perhaps then you can either use it to increase your saving to us, your retirement, or your meeting of your other immediate financial needs. And I think this is a very good initiative that with great awareness and of course in support with the regulative, uh, legislative initiative by our regulator, um, I think the industry is gonna going to, of course, uh, substantially uh, benefit. This, however, needs to be balanced out that 40% access in the sector would obviously have immediate access will obviously have a lot of impact negative in the capital markets. Um, and and um, we need to approach this in a balanced view that we don't end up having members with a house without uh, a pension. When we test it, if the members never get to access their balance and they continue to accumulate their balance of their pension that they have, um, a part of it they have used to access mortgage. Um, at retirement, the differential in terms of the um, income replacement rate is just about 5%. And so you end up to have um, a house while you also have perhaps also a decent pension arrangement. I wrap up with um, uh, just the budget was read yesterday and of course, the cabinet secretary indicates uh, that our GDP expected growth is about 2.5% um, uh, in, the, in the current year. And then of course, um, the CS treasury, of course, the physical deficit of about 7.5% of the GDP and the bulk of um, um, uh, taxes, one of those that are new that is going to hit us is online transaction now at 1.5%. The bulk of pension sector has invested massively in Safaricom, and I know this is one area that I know the fund managers are going to analyze and see the kind of opportunities and impact on the pension sector, um, especially on that particular line of revenue. Uh, now that Safaricom is a big gainer uh, with uh, the lockdown and more digital platforms in terms of Zoom meetings and data uh, that uh, buying uh, that is happening through, of course, the online uh, uh, transactions. Um, in the capital markets, of course, now uh, there's a proposal that the um, uh, private equity is now under CMA. Um, and that's also, I think, just to be able to safeguard the sector. And of course, uh, the other key thing is that uh, we have the national pension policy and also then the macro pension uh, program that is also likely to uh, happen uh, just to ensure that we have wide coverage. And I think this is good initiatives as well as also seeing that um, um, the, we, we, the, 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 the county government retirement benefits uh, scheme 
um, the issues, the legal issues are resolved around it so that it benefits, uh, it harmonizes that sector and also the proposal to have penalties if there are delays for actual violation reports, mainly for defined benefit schemes. What is our takeaway? I think we could encourage our members to increase uptake of additional voluntary contributions when the regulations for home ownership are finally gazetted and there's adequate savings in the pension sector, it would be much easier for members and to apply their 40% into the home ownership program. I think also there is need uh, still to push a lot of awareness. And of course, trustees can start um, once the regulations are in place, proper documentation process flows that are aligned to this. And then of course, not so sure, but I think this is on a need uh, basis, uh, review of trustee in, uh, uh, by the trustees and the fund managers on the investment policy, particularly if the need analysis for members will push a lot more access uh, for the 4% transfer into the home ownership. This may have a little bit of fair impact on the underlying assets in the pension scheme, and therefore there will be need to asset liability model for the pension sector. Uh, with that, Pansy, thank you. We hope this information is helpful. Um, to enable a member to have a house at age 30. You can imagine if you are at age 60 and your landlord comes and removes the door. Uh, you know at that age, your blood may not be warm enough to withstand the cold. So <laughs> we are in support of this initiative, just that we want it in a balanced uh, approach. Thank you, Bansi. Over to you. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, and I'll request that if you have any questions, just raise your hand and uh, Simon will uh, be happy to address. I see one, Wangeshi has raised her hand. I'm not sure whether it's a question, but I've allowed you to talk, Wangeshi. And uh, Mr. David Nyakundi, I've also allowed you to talk. Just unmute yourselves. Wangeshi? Yeah, thank you very much. I put my hand up earlier when I couldn't hear Mr. Wafobwa, but uh, this is good enough. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering about the housing project I, as a very key pillar in the um, dignity in aging. I'm wondering whether there's enough information to corporates and to staff, uh, especially those who are salaried, to be sensitized to the need to lock in a home. I saw the graph you did. When, it's at, when you are younger, you pay less on a monthly basis because of the compounding factor. But is there any sensitization to people who are younger at 30 to lock in the housing need much earlier? Much earlier in life than waiting till they are in their 40s and their 50s. Because in their, 20, in their 30s, they have disposable income. In their 40s, they are paying school fees. Um, and it's a need to fix and beat. And why I'm asking that is because in the Western cultures, uh, we have free public schools, free education for children. But here, from the time somebody um, has a child in nursery school, they are paying over 50,000 shillings in school fees. That is the money that would have been going to housing. What are we doing to sensitize staff to start putting aside their housing shelter budget earlier in life. Okay, thank, thank you. Wangeshi. Thank you so much, Wangeshi. And uh, that's a very valid question. Uh, if you notice, I did mention that uh, um, knowledge capital, timely knowledge capital is an asset because it helps someone to uh, minimize the chances of making um, mistakes that may cause them in their life long. And so I concur with your observation and suggestion. Uh, we know that in the pension sector, pension administrators, uh, all through, through member education programs and also annual general meetings in partnership with trustees, are always doing member education programs. Um, but however, I think there will be a bias going forward, particularly from annual, to just be intentional and deliberate in pushing a lot more Um, Simon, you're breaking. Uh, 
So can you hear us, Simon? Simon? All right, it seems that he has an issue with his um, connection again. Uh, we apologize for that. And, but to answer your question, Wangeshi, um, I think uh, what Simon was trying to say is that uh, as animals, we do believe so that, that we position them five long digits. Simon, we'd lost you. Are you? Hi, Simon, you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Apologies. Okay. Uh, All right. All right. So maybe you can just. But I think I had answered uh, Wangeshi's question. Um, you were talking about the need for education and uh, what we as animal uh, will seek to do. Maybe you can just reiterate that. Yes, I think through our digital platforms, uh, through the online, we have we 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 in our new online portal, we are putting in financial literacy programs uh, on video clips that will outreach through our training and member education department, which is headed by Bansi Kaleli, uh, just to be able to enhance awareness on this program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Simon, and welcome back. Uh, so I'll allow Mr. David Nyakundi and Eric Oiji to ask their questions. And uh, um, I see Mr. Mutuku is also with us. So if you also have a question to the authority or to Jerry Simu uh, from the Ministry of Housing, please feel free, to, feel free to ask those as well. So David and then Eric. Thank you so much, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, David. Thank you so much, I don't know whether Mr. Nzomo might for my colleague is around. This question probably yes. may, may be a better place to answer it. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the current law uh, replacement yeah. rate. Yeah. Hi, Nzomo, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know we have law, law replacement rates, which we have been working over the years to increase. I, I hear the current is about 3%. And the idea about preservation is to lock in as much as possible so that people at the end of the day have an improved replacement rate when they retire. Of course, with the, an extra early access option to buy a house is a widened early access, which of course certainly will have an impact on the current replacement rate. I do not know whether there is a survey uh, that probably which has been done or which probably will be done to show what impact in terms of replacement rate this will have to the members in the next few years and uh, whether this policy will gradually erode the concept of preservation and probably do away with um, a pension system. The question to Simon is uh, whether as pension administrators we have done any survey, a, a quick survey, just to answer the question whether this policy will benefit many pension members, scheme members. If most people have saved less than three million, and we do know complete houses will probably be four or five million plus, very difficult to get very low priced homes within the cities. How much people do you think will benefit with the 40% limitation of 3 million? I mean, of 3 million savings, for example, where probably maybe from your survey, you will probably know how, how much in terms of savings people have in various pension plans. And I suspect will be the bulk will probably be less than 3 million. 40% of that, which house will you buy, which is complete understanding, and how will this then benefit scheme members? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nyakundi. Um, I'll allow Mr. Mutuku to answer, then followed by Simon. Thank you, David, and uh, good to hear from you. You should be answering these questions being an old uh, hand in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I think you're right about the replacement rate. Um, obviously, if you access the money prematurely to buy a house, then you are going to compromise your ultimate uh, replacement rate. But you could argue that um, you know the rent that you would have been paying, you should add it back into the replacement rate when you're calculating. Because otherwise, if you didn't have the house, you'd be paying rent. Mm -hmm. 
or maybe the house is even earning you an, an additional income on top of that. So you may want to, um, you may need to look at how you calculate replacement rates for those who have accessed but gotten a house which is helping them in, in retirement. Yeah. Uh, but the better solution, of course, is the kind of Singapore solution where in the scheme you have your saving for retirement, but you also have a separate saving for housing and a separate saving uh, for medical. And this is why they contribute uh, 37 percent of salary mm. uh, because some is going to retirement some is going to housing some is going to medical so none is compromising uh, the other and i think that's the point that i've made and i think someone has also made that as members we really need to look at how we can save more uh, so that as we benefit from this uh, housing we don't compromise on the retirement side okay. thank you so much sir simon um, indeed, Ms. Nyakundi, we have uh, done a quick survey within our membership. And the first is that there is a lot of interest. Uh, the number of calls when we send out the poll is so huge. The response is so huge. What we'll do that in the slides we are going to share to the panelists, we'll include in part of the information we got. Um, and. Um, it's true that the bulk of membership will be below, in terms of savings, below three million. Uh, obviously, because they are young and they haven't worked for long and they haven't as low as much contributed, adequate, uh, you know, accumulated a significant uh, uh, savings. Uh, but I think the point of comfort is we have started somewhere, because there will be never be the best time to start. Um, and, and, and we are not just starting somewhere as a nation, we are starting somewhere to address a problem that has been there for a long time and I think is in a good direction. Um, the other key level of comfort, and I know Jerry may also comment on this, is that the government is saying uh, one, two, three, one, one, there, <laughs> hopefully this is going to be delivered, <laughs> one million, uh, one bedroom for one million. Uh, two bedroom for three million, and then three bedroom for three million. So if someone has a saving of just uh, maybe two million, uh, then they still have chance for a two bedroom house, hopefully so that they don't pay rent, but also enjoy a house while they are saving. Jerry, you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, Simon, and uh, thank you so much for that. I think the you, you actually said um, a good thing by saying we are, we've started and we're headed in the right direction because we've had a systemic issue in the past of addressing um, affordable housing, um, but then there is now a deliberate agenda to um, create an enabling environment for home ownership at the lower end of the uh, income spectrum. And therefore, the issue of whether is there enough, because there's a lot of homeowners, a lot of industry players are asking themselves, is there enough? When is the supply going to come on stream? But because this, we have started this journey, um, we, there right now there are houses under construction in, in Park Road, um, about 1,370 units. These are priced at uh, one bedroom, 1.5, two bedroom, two million, and um, three bedroom at three million. Um, there are uh, projects of about another 10,000 units within that same general area, which is in an urban setting um, that will be commencing um, in a very short period of time. Um, there are other private projects that are also under construction. So this again will address when people see these projects coming on stream, will address part of the issue of communication because you can attach um, a project and something that is real to, to this um, discussion of are there actually houses that are coming on stream to answer the question of one of the um, um, people on the pa who asked, are there actually houses that are avail coming on stream at um, sub four million? The answer is yes. And um, there are a number of projects coming on stream. Perhaps maybe we should be doing a better job of communicating this. Um, but that, when, when you attach a real project 
at an affordable price. And then we add the number of interventions that are being done and this critical intervention by RBA because it's not, it's even if you are able to access, I think in Simon's presentation, you've shown that maybe a 30 year old person may be able to access about 400,000. Now, if you take that 400,000 with a combination of, um, and as most Kenyans are not necessarily necess relying on one source of income, um, then you, you top that up with a mortgage. Then you start becoming more attractive to um, developers and you become more attractive to, to bankers in terms of uh, your ability to be able to plug that gap between you know, your, your ability to finance a house at 3 million if you're able to access even you know, 25% of that through your pension when you're still young, when you're still able to um, access an asset that will be appreciating over the period, the rest of the period that you're working. So I think it's, um, there is some work that needs to be done on, on sensitizing the market in terms of how do you access um, this, this very attractive um, intervention that has been made. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jerry. And, 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 and Jerry, you know, you just, uh, uh, one of the key questions is how many pension members know that you, <laughs> you are actually planning to do 10,000 units uh, and um, so that they can benefit. And uh, just to tie up that, I know there was Mr. Maloba who asked a question, definition of a house and tying up with the feedback from the CORBA that a house is a complete unit. And that's very exciting because we've had so many disappointments of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of plan projects that um, Kenyans actually made deposits and those projects never materialized five years after or 10 years after. But it's a lot more exciting and more comfortable to say that I am putting my 20% and I can see it, I can see the house. Um, and, and, and that's just a very huge uh, opportunity that we need to create a lot of awareness in our sector. Hopefully then our members in the sector can benefit from this. Bansi, back to you. Thank you, Simon and gentlemen for the responses. I'll allow us to take, uh, I think like five questions, then we just answer them at a go. Um, the first one is for Mr. Motuku and it's from uh, Mr. Hassan Disho. He asks that, are there provisions for people on uh, gratuity? We have many government employees on short-term contracts, say three, three years, and who will be offered gratuity at the end of the period. So is there any consideration for them? Now I'll allow Eric Witi uh, to ask his question, followed by Margaret Ndwaru. Eric? Thank you, Francie. I don't know if my question has been partly answered. Uh... <laughs> I was also looking at uh, I'm, I'm more concerned about the amount of information. Mm -hmm. What if we accumulated uh, the, the, the benefits based on uh, a projected uh, projected benefits? Mm -hmm. Because like for mortgage, we assume that there's going to be a payment, say, for 10, 15 years. Likewise, why can't we work this with a pension and say that we are doing a projected benefits or a benefits quote? Mm -hmm in the next, say, you can have a car or a limit, say, the next 10 years. <laughs> Maybe just to boost and say, in the next 10 years, this is my, your projected accumulated benefits is going to be this, rather than using the actual as of, as of now. Probably that can maybe give some cushioning in terms of the amount to give the 40%. Okay, thank you, Eric. So your question is on using future, future savings value. Margaret, uh, please ask your question. Margaret, are you with us? Yes, please. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you so much, Simon and uh, Jerry. Thank you so much for the presentation. My question uh, is about uh, uh, people who are, no, who are self-employed. In the industry, we have so many people who left the employment like last year and last year but one. And most of them are below age 40. Is it possible for those people who are uh, self-employed to access the affordable houses through their savings, which is an uh, individual pension plan. Uh, my, second question, my second question is about uh, people who retired 
uh, uh, at around 50 years and they are under IDD plan. Is it possible for them to access the money which is under the savings, which they are supposed to access at age 60 years? Is it possible to access that fund to buy their, for their affordable houses before they acquire that age of 60 years? Okay, thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, Paul Okwemba. Paul? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mutuku, mm -hmm. and it's in regard to awareness. Uh -huh. The regulator and the government are obviously coming up with a lot of initiatives. Mm -hmm. But when you come to the ground, you find that the level of awareness on members is very low. What are the policy interventions that the regulator is thinking of to make sure there is something like compulsory member awareness programs akin to the TDPK for the trustees, which is very successful. Mm. Can we have trustees compelled to put their members through compulsory training that will change the mindset on how to approach financial planning? And can this topic, uh, financial planning, be cascaded down to the education system, say the universities, the colleges, and down to the secondary schools? Because I think it is the biggest obstacle to the uptake of the programs. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Paul. And finally, George Oyuga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bansif and uh, Simon, CEO Enwell, together with uh, all the other panelists. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, mine would be uh, directed to uh, Mr. Mutuko. I know we've had uh, offline engagements through the Q&A uh, panel, and uh, I want to appreciate the feedback that he gave on the query that I raised earlier uh, around uh, the concern that uh, we are currently on a regime that um, uh, pension savings are done through a defined contribution uh, platform. And uh, these are departure from the former defined benefits, which if you compare the two, the DB arrangements uh, would actually be formulated to try and address a healthier IRR uh, for individuals. But the DC arrangements are currently more uh, setups are being done from a cost perspective. Yeah, and the like. And uh, thanks for the response that you gave me on that. Now, my question now is just around uh, the fact that uh, uh, for a long time, we've not had a very good uptake on uh, additional voluntary co contributions. Uh, it's a provision within schemes, within regulation, but uh, the uptake among schemes has been very, very low. And mainly because maybe we've never pegged uh, a more value add uh, proposition uh, towards uh, the same. A good attempt at uh, the post retirement medical that, yes, was to be onboarded uh, within the retirement savings platform and um, uh, again give people that, that benefit. But when you look at uh, the way we are approaching the mortgage and housing access issue, we are not doing it uh, uh, in a better way compared to how we approach the post-retirement medical. Because here we are eroding what has already been saved without uh, countering it with uh, maybe um, a higher contribution platform uh, to be able to uh, supplement uh, the gap that is being filled. So my proposal would be that uh, since uh, all these onslaught on the pension savings that have been done currently is actually a vote of confidence that uh, the sector is a uh, trusted uh, savings haven. And uh, congratulations, Mr. Mutuko, again for the uh, Kenya pension industry being ranked number two uh, in Africa after ASA. So the confidence the industry, the government, and everyone else is giving is that the pension space is the best saving space that we can do. So it's a call to us, a call to action, to be able to then build the infrastructure around uh, the pension environment to be able to accommodate and tick the box on such important issues like housing and the like. So a more sustainable approach would be to formalize the infrastructure for housing to allow for ABC housing within schemes 
so that it does not come and then counter again the same, same um, already strained platform where we were saving less, especially under the DC schemes. Thank you. Thanks so much for your remarks. It's like you want a party for the sector <laughs> from the boss. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Okay, that's right. Okay, yeah. so I'll allow us to just answer those questions. Um, I think there are a few directed to Mr. Motuku. So, Mr. Motuku, if you may please um, start us off. Okay, thank you, Bansi. Uh, I switched off my video because uh, there seem to be a lot of internet challenges today. I don't know why. So okay. It's better when the video is off. Okay. Um, so um, if I start with uh, the last one and the party, we actually we are going to, we are supposed to have a party this year <laughs> because this year is marking um, 20th anniversary of that year. Oh, wow. In October. Mm. So hopefully by then uh, we'll be able to have a physical, physical party. Mm, yes. <laughs> and we shall invite all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank but you. Um, I think it's a very good point that George is making that um, for post retirement, we took the approach of you save now additionally, and then when you reach retirement age, you get this additional benefit. Uh, but for housing, we have taken the less sustainable approach of you take the money out now, and therefore, you compromise um, other, other objectives. But certainly, it's a very valid point. Uh, but like we said, you know, in terms of uh, housing, there are so many benefits that one gets in having their own home uh, now, uh, not just in retirement, but even uh, today. Um, so it was felt that um, it's an area that we can perhaps compromise, uh, but try to balance between the long run objective and the short run um, um, objective. Because of course, housing is unique. Uh, if you are you know, staying in a house, in your own house, even as you're saving, uh, you're certainly better off than the person who is uh, not having a house. But def definitely the point is very valid that George is, uh, is making. Uh, on post-retirement, um, I just want to say that um, uh, as, as RBA as an employer, uh, we have uh, launched this in our institution. Uh, we have a scheme where you can save and the employer also saves. We made it voluntary for our staff, so they didn't have sort of must. But I'm happy to say that 100% of staff have joined in. And they are contributing, and we are contributing. And when they reach retirement age, they will have this fund, which will be specifically for catering for their medical in retirement. So I want to urge other employers to come and see what we have done and see if they can set up similar funds within their pension scheme. Uh, for their staff to enjoy post-retirement medical cover. So coming back to the other questions, uh, the first one was on gratuity, a uh, very good uh, point. We have always said that um, as an employer or even as an employee, you're better off putting even your contract staff in the scheme uh, and contributing that amount that you would eventually pay them as gratuity through the scheme. You would get a tax advantage because gratuity is heavily taxed, as I saw in one of the questions. And you also have the security because if the employer closes like the employers that we are seeing closing today you know it's, chances are that the employer is not going to pay the gratuity because they have no money but if they had used the scheme the guys would have gotten their money from the scheme because the scheme is a separate uh, legal entity and the money would already be inside so um we have all along urged even contract staff there's nothing which stops contract staff from joining pension scheme and the employer can contribute the same amount that you will eventually pay in gratuity into the scheme as opposed to uh, gratuity. So no, if you are in gratuity, you cannot benefit from this because this is being done through the scheme and uh, you're, not, uh, you're not in the scheme if you're in a gratuity uh, use. Can you use projected benefits? Uh, it's tricky because we don't know whether those, those monies will be there. You know, if somebody is retrenched tomorrow, uh, then the money will not be there. So if you have given him money upfront only for him to lose his job tomorrow, then you know where will you get the money from uh, to repay the scheme? Um, so that's why we don't use uh, the projected um, uh, benefits um, approach. But of course, uh, we still have the other approach of the mortgage. So if somebody else gives you the loan and you use what you have in your scheme um, as a guarantee. And that one, of course, has a higher threshold of 60%, uh, not the 40% on this side. So that can help a bit. Uh, Margaret, um, 
the issue of um, those who are in early retirement, can they benefit? No. Once you're in early retirement, uh, you're already earning uh, the benefit from the scheme, just like other retirees. Uh, so now you cannot benefit from this, because like I said earlier, this is for those who have not yet reached retirement. So whether it's normal or early, uh, you, would not, um, you would not get it. Uh, Paul asked about awareness. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, should we not have a member awareness um, uh, the way we have trustee uh, training? Um, in, in the guidelines that we issued last year, the governance guidelines, uh, we are forcing trustees to really uh, do a lot in terms of member awareness. So I know we have postponed the, uh, the, the date for implementation because of COVID, but as they come into effect, you're going to see trustees are going to have a lot of uh, responsibility to do member awareness. So we have we have catered for it through the governance uh, guidelines. With regard to the curriculum, we have worked with um, our fellow regulators, CMA, IRA, and Central Bank. And we have actually funded um, KICD, the Institute of Curriculum Development, uh, to do financial education training within the school's curriculum. And not just universities or secondary, right from the beginning, from the time we started one. Uh, we are incorporating financial issues into the curriculum right from the beginning. So those who are doing the new CBC uh, curriculum, you will see that um, it has issues to do with finance uh, incorporated into it. Um, so we did that jointly as financial sector regulators and you're going to start, we hope we will see the impact of that in terms of more financial awareness amongst uh, Kenyans over time as that curriculum is rolled out. I know it's still it's at three or something, but as it continues to roll out, um, you, will, you will hope to see that impact. So I think uh, those are the questions I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the assurance, Mr. Mutuku. I think um, yeah. I'll allow someone to speak. Yes, uh, just to echo a little bit on what the CEO of RBI has mentioned on gratuity. You know, gratuity, a member would be taxed 30%. But uh, the applicable tax reliefs when the funds are uh, the in savings are done through a pension program, and they are much better compared to gratuity arrangement. Number two is that uh, in pension, as the funds are invested, so there is growth on return. But gratuity, the only semblance of growth would be if your employer would then vary uh, the salary. Uh, but that's not guaranteed. And then, of course, there is safety in pension. And, and safety is in various dimensions. One is that the funds are set aside, but also there is a law that requires then that when you leave, you have to be paid within 30 days. Graduity, um, if you leave and you haven't returned the laptop uh, to your employer, those are some of the issues that might delay access. But in pension, whether you return the laptop or not, you will still get your money. Uh, that, those are things that will have to be separated. And I think then there are a lot more compelling uh, benefits like George uh, Oyuga uh, of, observed with a vote of confidence. And there's a lot more compelling reasons to save through pension. I wrap up by saying this, that Jerry has been gracious He's saying that he's going to share the pipeline of affordable uh, mixed use. Uh oh, no, I think uh, we lost Simon again. Uh, but he was just saying that uh, Mr. Simu has offered to share with us the pipeline of projects um, that the um, ministry is um, currently undertaking. Jerry, you want to speak to that? Yes, uh, I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, because there are a number of projects that are not only national government projects, mm -hmm. but um, but to highlight a number, there is uh, Park Road, there is Sharimoyo, there is Starehe, there is a number of others also within that general area that are coming on stream. Mm -hmm. um, then there's, there are other projects that are also coming up on the side of... Uh, on the towards the Mavoko Siokimau area and then towards the Kiambu Juja. Um, so both government and private projects that some are already in construction and uh, others are about to break ground soon. I'll be happy to share that. The PS has also just said he will be 
joining to give his uh, maybe closing remarks. Um, so maybe if you just give him a second uh, as, as you continue the conversation, he'll also be joining. Oh yeah, I can see him joining us. I think he's already on, yes. Okay. Welcome, uh, Buona Pies. Can you hear us? I think he needs to unmute himself. <laughs> yes, great. Yes, we can see you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Um, welcome so much, uh, Buona Pies. Uh, you've caught us at the tail end. Um, so I think it will be baptism by fire. <laughs> uh, so we'll allow you to just um, make uh, your remarks and we're very honored to have you uh, make time to even join us. So please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And I sincerely apologize uh, um, for not joining uh, the conversation earlier on. Uh, this was something that I was uh, looking forward to uh, because uh, you're a key sector. Um, the, the pension sector is very, very important when it comes to facilitating majority of our working men and women um, so that they can be able to uh, have the dream of owning their homes um, come alive. Um, we, we, had, we have engaged uh, with some of you uh, around how this will work. And we have also uh, managed to understand some of the concerns. Um, and, and, and so I was very keen, and perhaps you can summarize for me, what has been uh, deliberated on um, in terms of how do you see this happening? Because it is uh, what, what we are looking for is partnership rather than a, a top-down approach. We want to... Um, at the end of the day, it is your members who would become the beneficiaries uh, of this uh, initiative. So that, that is what we are all uh, aiming to do. Um, as most of you know that uh, rental cost is one of the biggest uh, expenses that they, um, those who have gone into retirement are facing. And then also... Uh, you all know about the numbers that we're talking about for a country of 47 million, the number of people who have got their own mortgages. And majority of those who have mortgages tend to get them also later, uh, you know, towards the, uh, the latter part of their useful economic life. And, and that is uh, part of what we're trying to reverse because we want people to own their homes uh, pretty early um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, owning uh, early enough in life, uh, first of all, gives one the ability to be able to pace themselves so that uh, what we call uh, affordable housing, which is um, you should not pay more than 30% of your disposable income, either to own or to rent a house, is actually achieved. Um, and so the longer the tenure that you have, the better. Number two, uh, we want you to also uh, benefit from the equity buildup, uh, and so that even at some point, even if you were to uh, offload that house, uh, you'll have built enough equity over time. And uh, so part of that can also go, you can buy another uh, unit, um, but still have quite a bit of uh, money uh, from just the investment, uh, uh, you know, from, 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 from the growth in the capital. Uh, and the equity in, 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 the, in, the, in the program. And then lastly, is the, the biggest challenge with the, uh, the law as it is right now, where it allowed um, you know, uh, pension members to uh, use their pension as a guarantee, is that uh, the financial institutions don't count that uh, when it comes to uh, looking at the affordability, um, and the rate at which they're going to charge you. So, so you find that um, essentially uh, you, you are uh, exposed to market rate uh, interest rates. Uh, the tenure does not uh, also favor uh, you either. And, and so there is a, um, there, there is a challenge uh, and it has hardly been used uh, by the pension members. And that's why 
we, we went through this process of uh, amending section 38 so that now you can be able to access some of your uh, savings uh, to help you either reduce um, the cost of the unit uh, or depending on how much you have saved, uh, use that money to buy yourself a unit. So um, I think today for me was more listening uh, rather than, uh, uh, you know, we have engaged with yourselves. We were at Kenya uh, Monetary School uh, a while back. So we have engaged with the industry. I came also for a function, an RBA function. Um, just to give you um, a little bit of uh, update on where we are. Um, the last bit, of course, is that we see a, a, a nice partnership between ourselves and the pension market, uh, purely because um, of the asset liability matching or mismatching. Um, most of your uh, liabilities are long term, and uh, having also an asset class but almost matches the, your liability profile. Um, I think it's something that is uh, very, very, very important. And so we believe, and that's why world over, uh, pension funds are big investors in the housing market. So we want to see how can we unlock uh, that here in Kenya. Lastly, is just to let you know that by partnering with government, you will be enabling your members to uh, unlock uh, or to access uh, probably the most audacious of all uh, uh, benefits that have been put together for potential homeowners. Uh, and I think this is very, very, very important uh, because if you don't do that, then you are exposed to the market, uh, the market forces. Uh, but we know that the, the, the market is broken, the housing market in Kenya is broken. And that is what government has moved in to fix so that it works for everybody. So in this case, um, where government owns the land, uh, the cost of that land is not factored in the ultimate cost of the unit. And I think for, especially those who are in the Nairobi metropolis, you will all attest that the biggest cost uh, to home ownership is actually in the cost of land. There is a study uh, that showed that land in Nairobi now is the most expensive in the continent. So you can't have most expensive land and affordable housing in the same sentence. That's why government, so for Park Road, for example, uh, that two billion shillings, which is the cost of the land, will be taken by government. So government is subsidizing by give, putting in land. So we would like to see more and more of your members, for example, uh, going and buying the units in Park Road because then they get almost uh, 30, 40 percent um, of, of, of the subsidy because government has put in the land. Number two is the cost of infrastructure. Uh, that also is uh, accounts to anywhere between 10 and 15 percent in the overall cost of the development. So again, in the approved affordable housing scheme, the cost of infrastructure, whether is if the private party puts the, the infrastructure, government uh, will provide like a double deduction um, so that um, so essentially we are saying it's a cost uh, that is uh, it's a government cost but we know that sometimes government processes don't move at the same pace as in the private sector so if you build the infrastructure there will be an instrument that you will get uh, for you to be able to discount that cost and that also significantly reduces uh, the price number three is that there is no stamp duties for first-time homeowners and that is four percent of the overall cost so again uh, if you enable your members to be able to unlock uh, some of the pension money, they are able to join and uh, now get a bigger benefit. And I can go on and on. There is an affordable housing relief. And uh, I don't know whether Jerry has managed to take you through some of those uh, uh, tax incentives. Yes. Overall, the overall the effect um, is that if you look at Park Road, a 3 million housing unit in Park Road is um uh, in the in the larger market it's going for about 7.5 million uh, that is the market value today so there's a huge amount of effort that government has put in just to lower the prices uh, so that uh, now you know in on average i think the the study that we had seen from the world bank showed that in nairobi uh, the average cost of housing i think was about 17 million uh, um, 11 to 17 million i think that is what you are looking at as the average cost 
Now we're talking about a one million house, a two million house, a three million house. We're talking about up to five million. You should be able to get quite a number of uh, units. So this is why, again, we are saying that um, it's very important to unlock that element of liquidity. But now the how we unlock it is, a, is what I understood is one of the ways that you are you are proposing you're coming up with ways of how to do that um so 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 let me pause there because you know i'm uh i'm i'm, I'm so much immersed in this thing and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, i've spoken to most of you uh, um, and you know where we are but my, my last point is to say is that we have moved out of boardrooms we have moved out of powerpoint presentation we are on the ground we have multiple projects that are currently ongoing and so there is an opportunity for us to have a very specific conversation. Can we test this model? I'm about, I've awarded last week um, three new projects, uh, Starehe, Shaurimoyo, uh, A and B. Uh, almost looking at 10,000 units which are going to be under construction very soon. So how can we be able to work with, the, with yourselves uh, so that we enable your members to be able to unlock, uh, unlock and be participants uh, in those uh, schemes in a very deliberate uh, way as opposed to just talking high level. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, P.S. Hinga. And thanks for joining us even at the last minute. Um, I'll allow all the panelists to just keep their closing remarks uh, due to time constraints. I'll start with you, Mr. Simu. Um, do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, I think the, the P.S. has wrapped it up very well. Okay. Um, this has been a, a very engaging uh, conversation. Um, I think the the support that we get from this pension from the pension sector is will go a long way towards um, plugging the gap in terms of the access to funding towards a home ownership. And therefore, um, I think in partnership with the schemes and the industry, um, I think this will be a very significant uh, uh, um, enhancement towards uh, home ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you for the holding forth um, as you're waiting for the PS. And we are very glad to hear that uh, the ministry is looking to partner and uh, we are open for that. And we look forward to having solutions for our members. So I'll allow Simon to just give his uh, closing remarks. Uh, thank you, PS. Um, Glad to see you again. <laughs> so, so I, it's quite exciting to hear you say you've moved out of PowerPoint presentations, you moved out of uh, boardroom discussions. Right now is Kazi Mashinani to get things done. And I want to let you know that uh, this is part of that initiative. On this platform today, uh, we had almost up to 170 trustees who represent various pension members, and that's how this conversation is going to the ground. Obviously then, we are creating awareness in, with, together with our industry stakeholders to see that then the pension sector, of course, uh, part, participates in this. And uh, uh, we thank also the CEO RBA, uh, uh, who has also graciously accepted to be on this discussion. And I think uh, he can wrap it up as our industry boss. Uh, over to you, Mr. Muzu, uh, Mutuku. Uh, thank you, Simon, and uh, good afternoon, PS. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, I think I'm happy to hear the PST's words. Uh, that is on the ground, and that is not even 10,000 units. In our discussion, of course, the issue which came up was that most members the amount they have saved may not allow them to buy a house for seven million or five million. But if there's a pipeline of houses of one million, two million, that is very good. And I think a lot of members will be able to uh, to benefit. And of course, as PS has said, they will also benefit from you know equity uh, because of the subsidy which is coming from government and and so on. I think that is very good news. Uh, it really sums up our our, our discussion um, very well. I just want to close by urging the trustees here, you know, go back to your members, really encourage them to see how they can save more. Um, you know, for them to enjoy this opportunity that we're giving them, it is really uh, going to require them to put more money into the, into the scheme so that they can access this housing without over-compromising uh, the retirement objective. So the message I want 
let's preach the gospel of additional voluntary contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mutuko. I think I'll say an amen to that. And as we come to a close, um, we are really honored to have all of you. There are so many questions uh, still pending. We'll try and answer them, but we'll send you this presentation and uh, a lot more details. At the end of this presentation, we'll receive a questionnaire. Kindly answer it. Tell us how we can serve you better, how we can support you better. And as always, this is brought to you uh, courtesy of mm -hmm. NWealth. Um, we do hope that we enable you to create wealth for a better tomorrow for a dignified retirement. We'll be more than happy to consult with you on your pension administration, uh, pension consulting, training, um, member training, and also insurance brokerage needs um, so that you are able to cushion your financial security. So I appreciate all the speakers and all the attendees for staying with us for the last two hours, and we'll end it here. Do have a blessed day and weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you.